The Prophet, peace be upon him, once said that one should seek knowledge, even if it meant to go to China. He said that the acquisition of knowledge was a requirement for all Muslims, whether male or female. He said that the ink of a scholar is more valuable than the blood of a martyr. The importance of learning and knowledge in Islam cannot be understated. Words approximately meaning like learning or knowledge are used in the Quran over 800 times. The very first word of revelation is very telling, the commandment to read. But why? Why is knowledge and learning so important? I mean, it's easy to say that, okay, societies that value knowledge and learning tend to be successful, they tend to have lots of prosperity, they tend to be more powerful and to build a better society, right? But, you know, many things are like that, agriculture and sailing, but why is, why is learning so important? Not just for a good society, but to be a good Muslim. Why does the Prophet, peace be upon him, tell us, tell us that we should go to China even to seek knowledge? And at, at, in his time, going to China was almost impossible. You could die across mountains. And it meant going to a completely diverse and foreign land. It would be like telling us to go to another star system. Really, really difficult. But why is knowledge worth such a dangerous feat? And for this question, the Quran has answers. Surah 45, ayah 13 tells us that, And he has subjected to you whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth, all from him. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala filled his creation with a multitude of signs, ayahs, of a divine nature, proving the divine nature of creation. In the same way how each verse of the Quran is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so is all the machinations of Allah. And it's important to look at both. From, from even like tiny biology to the great expanse of the cosmos, we can look to the real world to see signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a further testimony to his creation. This tradition, to, to learn not just for the sake of learning, but to seek out the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has compelled, and it compelled the great medieval Muslim societies through incredible triumphs. They won't teach you this in Western textbooks, but Islamic science saw the creation of many things critical to our modern lifestyle and technology, from trigonometry, surgical tools, the first camera obscura, Algebra, the very first university. In fact, um, significant parts of our own lifestyle, like the three-course meal, can be directly connected to this revolution in science and technology and philosophy. It was really the beginning of a modern era for the entire planet. And this can be traced in, in what was called the Islamic Golden Era, which began pretty much right after the beginning of Islam. This period of time saw the rise of modern medicine beginning, the rise of chemistry. People started to focus less on creating gold, which was impossible, and focusing more on understanding what actually made chemicals work. And it also started something that's pretty important. It's called the scientific method. A man in Egypt in the 11th century named Ibn al-Haytham was looking at the works of Aristotle who said, you know, we should look at knowledge as just what we can see. And he said, maybe Maybe we can look at knowledge as something we can, what we can observe, but also what we can learn through experimentation. Now, it, it's not really common knowledge, but this is the truth. Islam has contributed greatly to all of modern science, and every science today has to thank Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages for the very basis of their entire fields. Muslims throughout history have known the value of knowledge and science in their quest to find signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the physical world. And it's important to understand that we've always had a tradition of valuing science and to understand what it brings to us. Because, as I said earlier, it's important to not only find value in the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also his works. Analyzing and understanding what really drives the natural world allows us to more readily accept and, and realize the true magnificence of the creation, to understand that this world that we're in is, 
incredible, it's unique, it's crazy, and every day we're learning more and more about it, and it's just more and more evidence piling on the table saying that this, this, is, the, this is the work of a creator. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ya Rasulullah. Something that's very common when people talk about science and religion is that word I just used there, and. Um, people, secularism, what we've learned in the last 50 years, have told us, even drilled it in our heads, that faith and scientific inquiry live in two little boxes that are separate, they, they can never intermingle. Religion, the realm of religion and the realm of science are fundamentally on opposite ends of a spectrum and they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be friends. And I think that that kind of assumption or that kind of way of looking at the world is unfortunate, it's inaccurate, it's disingenuous, and I think it's kind of a bit dangerous if you really think about it. Because it's never been that way. This is a new thing. In the past, People who looked at the world from a theological lens and people who looked at the world from a scientific lens were always one and the same. Even Sir Isaac Newton was a theologian. When he died, he said that his best, his greatest works were in Christian theology, even though we remember him for his laws of physics. When we go back to the Islamic scholars who were prominent scientists, chemists, or biologists, we have to remember why they pursued science. To, to what end? Did they do it for personal fortune? Did they know that if you know they invested in science and technology, they could make their empires great? And the reason they did it is why it's called the Islamic Golden Era. It's not called the Arab Golden Era, or the Persian Golden Era, or the African Golden Era. And yes, there were many Africans and Persians and Arabs who were pushing this movement forward. It was called the Islamic Golden Era because what characterized the movement was Islam. It was the rise of Islam and this incredible valuing of knowledge that pushed scientific thought forward, that helped people find meaning and find a, a reason to pursue such intellectual courses. Because they understood that looking at the mechanisms of the natural world helped them find these ayat, helped them understand the, the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for this I'll take an example. Uh, his Latin name is Avicenna, but he would, I imagine, go by Ibn Sina. He was a scientist, a medieval scholar, who wrote a famous textbook of the era. It was called The Canon of Medicine. This textbook was a complete encyclopedia of the human body, and it went through all ways of diagnosing illnesses and treating conditions. And for the first time, instead of using superstition or like random leeches to treat illnesses, People used an actual method that worked. People, people's lives were being saved. This was a legitimate process. And this book, The Canon of Medicine, was so effective and so powerful that it ended up being used as a textbook throughout all of Europe, India, and the Middle East for centuries, even after his death. But something else that Ibn Sina gave us when he wasn't looking at the human body was putting into writing what, what a lot of Muslims today understand as their practices. Consider this. Uh, Avicenna is well known for using his scientific knowledge for constructing a logical argument he used against uh, non-believers, saying, you know, I have evidence that this is, you know, God is real and I think that this is true. And he, he constructed this incredible philosophical argument that boosted the faith. And this argument was so powerful that many Jewish and Christian theologians borrowed it for uh, later works. So. The, the meaning, the ultimate message to draw from these historical figures who, who were able to bridge science and faith together as one concrete field of thought, not as separate things that when you do at the workplace and when you practice at home, but are fundamentally linked, is that we should be like these scholars, not just if we're scientists, but if you're just learning about things. They pursued knowledge not because it got them a job or made them rich or powerful. They pursued knowledge because they knew it was their duty as Muslims to seek out the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way we should all read the Quran, we should also examine the natural world and understand what it tells us. 
every time you learn something or you relearn something, not only are we reclaiming our lost knowledge from the days when humanity was just two people, but most importantly, simply by the act of observing and understanding, we are remembering and grasping the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's almost like a way of remembrance and a way of worship. Uh, I point to um, surah, the third surah, ayah 191. Who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while standing or sitting on their sides? They give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth. They say, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you. Then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create this world, this universe, with all its beauty and complexity, with its amazing rela uh, like relationships and scientific values, but also with us in it. He did not create this just so no one could actually observe it. He, he locked away laws of nature in, in the most difficult places, and yet we've been able to seek out there and find what makes the world work. And this way, if you search for truth, no matter where you find it, you're seeing truth that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're seeing signs. We cannot separate religion and science as if they're opposites, because they're also similar that they answer big questions that we have. Why is the world like this? How should I act? Why do things happen? As scholars and scientists in the past engage with their faith, many of them realize that if you just use science, it doesn't paint a full picture. You can't just answer every single question with scientific inquiry. But it's also important to understand that if, if you rely entirely on faith, you also can't access every corner of knowledge. There's a reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us both the revelation, but also with reason. So we could look at both the works and the word. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world because we, and we cannot forget that this world, the signs of this world, were created to be ultimately found. And that is why I think science and the search of knowledge, and just learning, even if you're not discovering something new, simply just learning more about the world around you is a way to engage.